everyone. You're here and there are more of you. <laughs> I am so thankful and excited that y'all are interested in black history and film and have taken the time out of your day to join me. I also want to give an extra special thank you to those that have subscribed. Hey friends, thanks so much for the support. You're the best. <laughs> In today's episode, I'm going to be talking about the all-black cast films produced by Norman Studios, and also I'm going to give you a little background on the founder of the studio, Richard Norman. There's a lot of information to impart, so this episode is going to be another two-parter. I'm going to start off with a little bit about Richard Norman. Norman, not a black man, <laughs> was a white fella born in Middleburg, Florida in 1891. He began his filming career without a studio behind him in the 1910s, making films for white audiences. His most notable films at that time were The Wrecker and Sleepy Sam the Sleuth. Beginning in 1919, he started producing all black cast films. His reasoning for making these films was more than just financial. Obviously, there were a lot of black folks who would pay to see films starring people that looked like them, but he was also motivated by the unfair state of race relations when it came to actors at the time. He not only wanted to tap into the black filmgoer market, he wanted to showcase the plethora of wasted black talented actors that were unable to obtain work in mainstream films due to, I mean, <laughs> racism. Sorry, <laughs> that was. His first silent film with an all black cast was called The Green Eyed Monster, and that one came out in 1919. It was an eight reel moving picture that was an adaptation of his film, The Wrecker. Its main plot is one of jealousy and moida. <laughs> and there is a comedic subplot. Now, as far as I know, there are no copies of this film, and you will not be able to find an in-depth synopsis on the internet, but lucky for you, you know me, and I have an actual clipping from the time that I'm going to read to you. I warn you now, the <laughs> wording is very archaic, this is 1919, so there's a lot of extra words in there and a lot of stuff where you're like, did you just make that word up? I'm okay. <laughs> anyway, so I've got it here. It's in a frame because it's extremely fragile and I don't want it to just crumble. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to read this for you. Starts out with a little thing that says, the green-eyed monster, stupendous all-star Negro motion picture. The characterizations in this spectacular production were enacted by colored people chosen from many different walks of life. The lawyer, doctor, banker, and Finnish actor and actress portray this story in which a subtle way suggests the advancement of the colored race along educational and financial lines. A million dollars worth of railroad equipment was used in the filming of this production. An $80,000 train wreck is part of the story. The plot of the play is absorbing from the first, detailing as it does with the eternal triangle, two men in love with one girl, but the undercurrent brings in the interesting factor of two rival railroads and their fight for supremacy. Before the government assume chaperonage over the arteries of travel and transportation, and when two roads ran on different routes to the same specific point, there was a rivalry between them as to who should carry the government fast mail. In order to ascertain the fastest of these, a race is run. And it was by winning this race that the hero of the green-eyed monster also won the hands of his sweetheart. Throughout the picture, many thrilling scenes occur, all of which will be even more interesting than the usual thrillers because of the fact that the characters our colored people, splendidly assuming the different roles of railroad president, financial backer, traffic, manager, directors, superintendent, railroad contractor, minister, lawyer, doctor, and representing the cream of talent of the colored race. Rich in dramatic suspense, thrilling situations, red-blooded romance, side-splitting comedy, a super production teeming with thrills, action and punch. Woo! <laughs> that 
was a mouthful, but I think you get the gist. <laughs> like I said, jealousy, romance, moida. And there you go, a little something extra for your friend. <laughs> this initial version of the film received mixed reviews, so Norman actually decided to split the film into a drama and a comedy, the green-eyed monster being one, and Love Bug being the second. And the films did significantly better split apart. After this film, Norman moved to Jacksonville in 1920 and bought Norman Studios at the age of 29. Prior to the purchase, he made all his films on the go, traveling from town to town, mining the talent, and just set up shop right in town. Basically, he was permanently on location until he bought the studio. The next all-black cast film he produced was called The Bulldogger, and that one came out in 1921. It was shot in Boley, Oklahoma, which was an exclusively black town, and the film features cowboy Bill Pickett, Anita Bush, and one-legged actor Steve Peg Reynolds. It doesn't appear that much of this film survived, but I did put a link to what is available in the description. As near as I can tell, this movie is about black cowboys, rope tricks, and steer wrangling. <laughs> but I haven't been able to find a full breakdown of what it's about. If you know, please feel free to enlighten me in the comments. The next all-black cast film that Norman released was called The Crimson Skull. This one was filmed at the same time as The Bulldogger and also features Pickett, Bush, and Peg, but it wasn't completed for release until 1922. I'm going to give you the full rundown on this film since there doesn't appear to be any surviving copies, though I did put a link to a one-minute video that was made by eArt Film that shows some still photographs of the movie set to old-timey music so you can get a picture in your head when I'm telling you this story. In this one, we're transported to a town riddled by bandits. The leader of the bandits is a fellow called Skull. In the video linked, that's the fella in the skeleton costume. The hero of this story is a gent named Bob, who is a ranch hand. Peg and his daughter Anita are kidnapped by the bandits. In order to rescue them, he infiltrates the gang with the intention of freeing them both, but he gets found out and he has to stand trial to decide his fate. Bob ends up outwitting the bandits and affects their capture, he gets rewarded with both money and Anita's hand in marriage. The last film I'm going to talk about in part one of this episode is called Regeneration, and it came out in 1923. Only about 10 minutes of this film exists today. Most of it was destroyed by nitrate composition, but I have watched what is available and read up on the scant information that there is out there, so I'll give you as much of a synopsis of the film as I'm able. Also, I put a link to a film in the description, RIP your eyeballs, if you watch it. It's a headache and I watched it many times, <laughs> just trying to figure out what was going on. This one stars Stella Mayo, who plays Violet, uh, and she's the orphaned only child of a widowed sea captain. MC Maxwell stars as the owner of the Annabelle fishing schooner and first mate to Violet's father, who has passed away by this time. Maxwell and Mayo come across a mysterious map that they decide to follow. Based on what I could see of the film, the pair are forced from the ship and stranded on an island. They name the island Regeneration, and the two live out a Robinson Crusoe-like fantasy, where they overcome an enemy, find buried treasure, and are rescued. The film was an instant hit, and part of the reason was because of the way Norman promoted it. He actually encouraged theaters to fill their lobbies with sand to draw potential customers in. <laughs> I don't even want to think of the mess that those poor ushers had to clean up after that promotion. And we're done with part one of this episode, folks. Before I go, I do want to mention that there are a ton of unsung vintage black artists out there that I don't talk about. Uh, because there really isn't enough information to do a whole episode on them. So I showcase them, their performances, and what history there is available on my Instagram. So, you know, if you're interested in that sort of thing, definitely check it out. 
In the concluding episode, I'll be sharing some more all black cast Norman Studio films, including information from my rare vintage clippings, as well as additional information on the studio itself. As always, if you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe. And I hope to see you here the Friday after next. <laughs>